In 1944, the Allies surge across Europe and look set to win the war. However, Hitler has other ideas and unexpectedly counterattacks. The shock to the Allied troops was immense, as a counterattack of this scale, in unfavorable terrain and weather, seemed almost unthinkable. The Nazi regime has taken heavy casualties on the Eastern Front, and now Hitler wants to make a big statement of intent and recapture all the ground the Allies had taken on D-Day. This offensive will go on to take more lives than any other in the war, but will Hitler be successful in clasping victory from the jaws of defeat? After four years, the Allies are finally back on European soil and the coalition spreads rapidly, retaking France and moving swiftly onto the Low Countries. In the East, Stalin and the Red Army has seen the tide of battle turn, and under attack on two fronts the Nazis are close to complete defeat. By early September, the Allies liberated Antwerp, a port city vital for supply lines that would be instrumental in the push eastwards. In contrast, the Nazi war machine had slowed due to dwindling supplies and material that had been devoured in a war on two fronts. Reports suggest that the German armies in the west are fighting with only one-fifth of the petrol needed to keep their tanks and vehicles moving. Hitler can see that situation is turning dire, however, he comes to the conclusion that retreat would be a disaster, and opts to start planning an offensive to devastate the Allies, and force them to negotiate for peace. His plan was simple, push for Antwerp and recapture the port city that, up till now, had been the lifeblood of the coalition's push east. Hitler's plan relies on two key factors, the element of surprise, and bad weather. By hitting them hard and fast he hopes to crush the Allies' growing morale, and with the bad weather, it will negate the overwhelming might of the Anglo-American air support. He gets reports of a fortnight of overcast weather and concludes this will be enough to complete his push to Antwerp. Meanwhile, the Allies are seemingly getting complacent as winter draws in. Omar Bradley is in control but only because Patton had recently been demoted. Bradley is probably underqualified for the role as regional commander, and potentially only got the job due to being good friends with the Supreme Allied Commander Eisenhower. Bradley was described as lackadaisical and was guilty of underestimating the challenge to come, due to the massive success D-Day had been. Bradley was so confident that he ordered celebrities to be flown out to entertain his troops, confidence that was beginning to border on the complacent. However, complacency was about to be taken advantage of. On the 16th of December 1944 at 5.30 a.m. a ferocious roar of enemy artillery opens up across the American-controlled sector, followed immediately by a wave of tanks and almost half a million German men. The tsunami of the Nazi war machine takes the Americans completely by surprise and in many sectors makes significant breakthroughs. The combination of shellfire and concentrated tank battalions punch the complacent Allied forces and allows the Germans to race toward major roads to continue their push to Antwerp. There is such great confusion about the attack that the American High Command doesn't even get reports of it until 3 p.m. 10 hours after the offensive had begun. Omar Bradley isn't even in the region on the day of attack, instead he is in Paris, congratulating his friend Eisenhower on his recent promotion to five-star general. Bradley dismisses the attack as a feint, but interestingly it's Eisenhower sat next to him who immediately orders reinforcements judging the offensive to be very serious indeed. Hitler's gamble seems to have paid off, and the element of surprise has been overwhelming, with the Nazi party causing chaos along the Allied lines. To make things worse, Hitler commissioned a group of commandos led by Colonel Skorzeny to go behind enemy lines dressed as American soldiers with the sole objective of causing as much confusion and distrust as possible. They cut lines of communication and send reinforcements in the wrong direction. This is one of Hitler's great masterstrokes, and a plan that works perfectly, the American army are now in utter chaos. In this confusion, the German war machine marches onto Bastogne and St. Vith, vital road hubs that will enable them to continue their advances. On the 21st OD December they take Street Vith along with 8,000 Allied prisoners, signifying the first significant victory of the offensive. Just like 1940 the offensive was built of speed, and the Panzer divisions move on in search of Allied fuel dumps for resupply. In the Ardennes, Bastogne is considered one of the most strategically significant towns, due to the seven roads that intersect in its borders. 
Control of the region is vital for supply lines. German tank divisions completely surround the town and besiege the Americans, trying to force a surrender without destroying the crucial infrastructure they would need going forward. The temperature was 12 below freezing and the constant German shelling was brutal. Despite the conditions, the Americans refused to surrender and meet the Nazi war machine head on. The casualty count was horrific but crucially they held on, buying the rest of the American army precious more time. Days into the siege four German commanders enter the town waving a white bedspread and demand total surrender from the Americans, or face the whole town and the civilians being reduced to rubble and blood. Brigadier McAuliffe gives them a one-word reply that echoes through history. Nuts. The Americans prepare for their destruction, with many considering that this was their Alamo, but then, the weather changes. The heavy fog that surrounded Bastin clears, and the skies fill with American fighter bombers severing supply lines that the Germans had laid. Resupply of the forward panzers was almost impossible, and Nazi vehicles are being picked off like fish in a barrel. Hitler has lost his main ally, the weather. This is when General Patton proved to the top brass why they were wrong to demote him. He turned his army round with terrific speed, covering 120 miles of terrain in just two days. He punches through German lines with his overwhelming amount of Sherman tanks and breaks through to liberate Bastin. On the 11th day of the siege the Germans root, giving the Americans the initiative and causing them to push the Germans back to the Rhine. German tanks literally run out of petrol on the retreat, leaving whole panzer divisions abandoned and the men walking back to Germany. Hitler has lost one of his most prized assets. He now sees the writing on the wall and orders a mass retreat. He himself moves back to Berlin and sets base in the bunker at the Reichstag, a place he will never leave. The offensive achieved next to nothing, and due to the large amounts of troops shifted from the eastern front to the west, the Red Army makes massive gains throughout Eastern Europe. By early February the Russians are within 50 miles of Berlin and closing in fast. Hitler paid the ultimate price of moving his best troops to the Ardennes, and away from the baying claws of the Red Army. Within four months Hitler will be dead, and the war in Europe will finally be over.